So we did the video understanding the Slain 6 uh, about 72 hours ago, and it's already got almost 100,000 views. So I, mean, I knew there was going to be interest in the topic, but I didn't know there was going to be that much interest in it. And it was one of the longer videos that we did. It, it ran 30 minutes. But here's, you know, what happened was, like, my ADD was kicking in through the whole time that we were filming that. And I was starting to step on some of my words, and I was leaving things out. And in my mind, my mental clock was ticking with this thing also. And I was saying, oh, don't go too long. You know, I knew it was going to be over a half hour, but I didn't want to go too far with it. So I figured, well, we'll do a part two. Um, but today is a rainy kind of day, and pretty much all of the stuff we were going to do today was going to be outdoors. So I guess this is as good a time as any to uh, go over things that I forgot. So I made myself a convenient list. So let's uh, let's go back to some of the things that I wanted to elaborate on in the video and didn't, and some things I didn't cover at all. Um, so we'll start with this. No, it's really starting to rain. That's right, we'll do this video in the rain. Um, aluminum blocks. I had said that the, originally the slant was intended to be cast in aluminum. And I forgot to put in the fact that they actually did cast about 50,000, give or take, aluminum blocks in 1960, 61, and 62. Uh, it was an option. It was an extra cost option. Uh, and not a lot of people went for it. Those blocks are still around. But they're not really good for performance use because they had very thin cast liners and an open deck, kind of like an Oldsmobile V8, you know, with the open deck. Um, they take a special head gasket, which isn't available, or it's like one of those unobtainium things. Uh, so they're not really suitable for, you know, performance use, and that's why I didn't really get into them. That's why I don't have one myself. Um, so that's that. Now, also, we talked about the difference between the 170 and the 225, but I never got into, you know, how do you tell the difference, you know, at a glance between a 170 and 225, because they have the same valve cover, same intake manifold, same slant, same everything. Um, at a glance, there's a bypass hose between the water pump and the bottom of the front of the cylinder head. On a 170, that bypass hose is about two inches long, and on a 225, it's about three, three and a half inches long. Um, you could like really, if, if, if you're familiar with the engines, you only have to like glance at it real quick and you can tell the difference. But externally, that's the only way to tell. The blocks themselves, if you have the, the engines apart, the blocks have very obvious differences in the way that they're cast and whatnot. But that's besides the point. If you're hunting for one of these motors and you're going through a boneyard or whatever and you want to tell at a glance, it's that water pump bypass hose. All right. Hyperpack exhaust. I had talked about the hyperpack. Uh, got into the intake manifold, and then at some point in the video I said, hyperpack exhaust, and then we'll get to that. Well, let's get to it now. Okay. The hyperpack exhaust consisted of two three into one cast headers. Uh, beautiful designs. But also, we were talking about the, the, the exhaust systems on, you know, running a dual versus a single. The Hyperpack race cars all had a single exhaust. Those two cast manifolds tied together in a Y pipe that was just right at the torsion bar and then ran back to the car with I think it was a two and a half or two and three quarter inch exhaust. But uh, I just wanted to cover that. Now I also said that the Hyperpack was available in test 62 as a dealer installed option, but that's not true. It was actually 61, and I'll tell you why. 1960 and 1961. The Slant 6 used a direct drive starter. They also used it in later years, like in taxi package cars up until like 1967, 1968. And it's essentially the same Hemi that they use on that, the same starter they used on manual transmission Hemis until 69. But at any rate, the direct drive starter fits a special flywheel. The direct drive starter has nine teeth on the Bendix and the gear reduction starter that they started using in 1962 has 10 feet. So the hyperpack exhaust manifold, the, the, the back one, will clear over the direct drive starter, but it won't clear a gear reduction starter. So it was only available dealer installed in 1960 and 61. Okay, uh, power adders. Like, this is a huge part of the whole Slant 6 thing that, like, I completely left out of the picture, and I don't know what's really starting to come down now. Well, I know why, because my ADD kicked in. 
but it's not going to kick it out because I made a list. So, okay, power in it. I'll run down the list from least effective to most effective, right, based on my experience and observation. Supercharger. Now, I actually built a supercharged Slane 6 for a customer last year, and the thing turned out really nice. Uh, later on, there were ignition problems. He bought some gizmo ignition, and the, the rotor uh, tab vaporized on the damn thing, and it detonated, and it, it knocked ring lanes out of the pistons. I did another short block from him, for him, but I have not seen the car since. At any rate, uh, it was a Torque Storm supercharger. It's a fantastic kit. I loved it. The car that went in was a 64 Valiant. Now here's the thing. If you're gonna if you're you're thinking about one of these centrifugal superchargers like the Torx one, keep in mind that in a 19 in the early A body, 1960, 1960 through 1966, the motor is set two inches further in the frame than it is on a 67 and later car. There's no clearance between the front of the engine and the radiator. To run a fan once you put the centrifugal blower on the front of it. You run into a problem now because moving the radiator forward, you're right up into the grill. So it took a lot of fabrication and a lot of head scratching to get an electric fan in that space between the grill and the radiator in order to make it fit. If you're going to go with a centrifugal supercharger, you definitely want to go with a 67 and up car. Now, Along the lines of the supercharger, and this has this has whether you're using a conventional roots type of blower, which I see a lot of guys have done, or a centrifugal. Something you want to keep in mind with the slant, putting a supercharger on the slant. Superchargers take horsepower to turn. The slant is a low output engine, and especially down low, and we got into all of that before. You are taking horsepower off the front of the crank to turn that supercharger. Up until I would say ballpark five six pounds of boost i think you're okay once you cross that threshold you get the seven eight nine you really want to blow you know mixture through this thing you may have problems a the proportional rigidity of the crankshaft and that has nothing to do with whether it's cast or forged it's just a long crank with four main bearings you could run into some portional issues driving the supercharger up the front of it at a higher boost level and you're stealing horsepower from yourself. All right, next up the list, turbocharger. Probably the most effective all-around way to wake up a Slant 6. Turbochargers love loads. The Slant 6 has its load built into itself with that long rod and, 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 and the tough geometry that goes on inside the engine. The Slant 6 is a natural for turbocharger. If you're so inclined, you know, that's a very good way to do it. Nitrix. Now my background is in blown nitro. I, I spent I spent a dozen years with blown nitro cars. And the internal geometry of a slant six is very, very similar to what you would find in a top fuel car. Top fuel cars are under square like the slant six, they have a long rod like the slant six, they have a lot of built-in resistance like the slant six. And the reason why nitro motors make as much horsepower as they do is duration of burn. So the piston because nitromethane carries its own oxygen supply, you can put a lot of it in the chamber and it'll continue to burn right past where the exhaust valve opens. Nitrous oxide gives you approximately that same benefit. The added, nit the, the, the added oxygen that you're putting in the combustion chamber with the nitrous oxide allows you to burn a greater amount of fuel. And because of that, you get that extended duration of burn, you can get into where the rod is really angled and really pushing on the crankshaft. I would say that nitrous oxide is probably the single most effective thing you can do with a slant. I know that there's one guy out there with a 170 and a Barracuda that sprays this thing, and it's an otherwise stock 170, and he's running down in the deep clothes with it. Amazing combination. You re really want to look in that direction. And also alcohol. Alcohol is another good choice for the slant six. Because alcohol will take 2.2 times the amount of liquid mixture in the chamber until you get that extended ratio of burn. If you're looking at a super high compression motor, like an all-out race motor, you're looking to get the max out of the slant, alcohol is a very good way to go. Of course, nitromethane would probably be even better, but again, that 
four main cranks that could run into some issues, especially if you get into bottom hole detonation, which is something that's a common problem with low nitro motors. Um, okay, what else? Okay, and the last thing is, a lot of you guys asked for a video of this dart, and we're going to put one at the end of this video. So, just so you know, we originally put this car together, we tried to get it to the starting line under 2,000 pounds, you know, starting line, me in it, gas, you know, everything ready to run under 2,000 pounds, that's why there's so many holes drilled in it, that's why it's as exceedingly light as it can be. And the idea is to go as fast as we can with a normally aspirated motor. Originally we built it with an automatic, we tried a converter in it, the damn thing didn't make enough torque on the bottom end to actually work the converter. So, we converted it to stick, made all the difference in the world. Uh, it's actually got an A903 3 speed because it's the lightest transmission we could stick in that car. Uh, the least amount of parasitic drag going through it. It's got a 7 and a quarter with 410 gears and, and welded spiders, which at this vehicle weight is more than strong enough to handle, you know, what we're throwing at it. And we hope to see the bottom 11s, or the bottom 12s, the high 11s with the car. The problem is we have so many things going on, especially like this YouTube channel, which takes up like 10, 12 hours out of the day. Um, we have so many things going on, it's really hard for us to get up to the track and sort these things out. But anyway, you can get a video, you can see the video of the last test hit we did, did on this thing, it was on the street. And uh, hopefully, you know, I keep saying it, but before the end of the year, we should be able to get out and get it moving. We have two slant builds working. One is the lightweight motor for this car. This one has a heavy crank and all of that, heavy block. So we're building a lightweight 81 and up motor. Oh, that was the other thing I want to talk about. You can spot at a glance the lightweight motor from the earlier motor, the 81 to 87 motor, because it has a different distributor hold down. 1960 to 1980 motors all have a plate that's that's screwed to the bottom of the distributor with a slot in it and a quarter 20 bolt that holds it to the block. 1981 to 1987 have like a, a more standard crow's foot type of arrangement with a 5 16 bolt. So if you're looking for one of those light blocks or a light crank and you're you know looking over blocks, just look at the distributor hold on and I'll tell you what it is. So I think. Right? That's about it. I'll show you a video of the dart. Um, thank you guys so much for the interest. Oh, wait. So, see? It's the ADD, and I didn't write this down, and that's why I'm bouncing all over the map now. The two builds that we're using, we're doing, is the lightweight motor for this car, and we're also going to do the 225 that we showed on the stand over at the shop. What we're going to do with that one is try to see exactly how fast we can go with a slant 6 using just the stock parts um, and we're going to try playing with cam timing um, we're, we're you know we're shaving the block and shaving the deck to get compression i know a lot of you guys go with a longer rod to try to get compression out of it yeah you'll get compression but it's at the sacrifice of bottom and geometry it's not a good idea you can take a hundred thousand off the deck of the slant you can take a hundred thousand off the head of the slant it'll get your compression right where you want it to be but there's a bunch of things we want to try with a stock motor to see exactly how much horsepower we can get out of it and we're going to put that in our white 64 and keep the thing completely street drivable so okay that's it i'm, I'm going to get out of the rain now I'm, my back is starting to get wet and, and i think my add is starting to go again too so thank you very much guys i'll see you tomorrow